in the 70 uh, in the 70th year of uh, beginning of Christian that is current our era the Jews were an agrarian and illiterate people living mostly in the land of Israel and Mesopotamia by 1492 the Jewish people had become a small group of literate urbanites specializing in crafts trade money lending and medicine in hundreds of places across the world around Mediterranean and other places from Seville to Mangalore what caused this radical change I am reading from the cover of the book called the chosen few uh, one of the uh, authors is with us his name is Tzvi Ekstein another one uh, Maristela Batticini was not able to make it she's co-author uh, with together with Tzvi of this I have to say amazing book I have read all kinds of books on Jewish history you know in my few years of life and I have to say that this book with its theories and with uh, numbers, figures, just an amazing, an amazing thing. Uh, I'm not the only one who thinks that way. You know, uh, many other people have uh, noticed the same thing. I mean, this is an amazing book written by our guest, Tzvi Ekstin, who is a professor of economics, not of Jewish history, of economics. He was uh, teaching at uh, in Tel Aviv and in uh, Wharton School of Economics here uh, uh, in Pennsylvania. And a year before the book was published, uh, he was uh, a deputy governor of Bank of Israel. That's correct. Tzvi, why would a deputy governor of Bank of Israel spend 10 or more years writing Jewish history? What, what? Well, uh, actually, I started uh, working on Jewish history before I became deputy governor. And my background in economics that relate to the book very much is uh, what we call labor economics. And uh, the main motivation uh, was that I am, as a labor economist, uh, worked a lot on occupational choice of individuals. And the key variable uh, in occupational choice, going back to the Nobel Prize winner from Chicago, uh, Gary Be Becker, uh, who is uh, an economist. And by the way, he himself asked himself the question. A, a place where I pursued my PhD in Jewish history. Yeah, but Gary Becker also asked the question, why the Jews specialized in skilled occupations over many, many years? Um, his answer was different than mine because his answer was that human capital is a mobile capital. And since the Jews want to be mobile, they invest in human capital. What we show in the book, that the investment in human capital came prior to their becoming mobile, meaning migraines. And in fact, it all started after the destruction of the temple that uh, basically to be literate and able to read the Torah and then later to read the Mishnah and, re and understand the writing of the rabbis will become the center of the new Judaism that was evaluated after the destruction of the temple and later on uh, during uh, the time that most of them were actually farmers. Mm. So Very they, interesting. Uh, so that came as a religious change. And what happened after it came is that they basically were reduced in numbers. First, they were reduced in numbers due to the, uh, they had, uh, you know, anti-Roman, uh, the Roman, anti-Roman war, you know, uh, they were, uh, I thought it was Roman anti-Jewish war, but okay, so well, let it be uh, anti-Roman war. The Jews war. were trying to be independent in the land of Israel and try to uh, get rid of the Roman uh, Empire. So there was a, a 
basically a, a big war with, with the Roman and the Jews, which was well documented by Josephus Flavius, uh, and it has been proved by archaeological evidence. This is the documentation is, is very uh, exact. And what we learn is that the Judaism has changed completely as moving from being like a regular pagan, you know, with a temple and sacrifices and, and, and rabbis at the temple to a religion that emphasized the ability of boys to read the Torah. And that was the first religion that made education mandatory and made teachers to be a very important uh, part and also the children very important. Uh, so are you so saying that there was a great benefit from destruction of the Jewish state and of killing a million people? You are saying that this was good? I'm, I'm not saying it was good in the in the sense that you know it was a good sacrifice. You know, losing all these people and and revolutionize and then start migrating. But what is important is that after you get the shock, the question is how you learn and what do you do to survive your identity. And that has been true for the Jews for all the history following. And even, I mean, if you want also the, the recent events that we have. And the key that was in Judaism is the investment in children's ability to read. And that enabled, and also they generated a whole Jewish law. And they generated a correspondence among Jews in different locations. And they generate a common law, both on commercial aspect and agricultural aspect. And when trade was available during the Muslim empire, it became a huge, what we call in economics, a huge uh, comparative advantage of the Jews to, uh, to basically, uh, to basically uh, uh, use the, uh, uh, basically, I have to basically get their uh, comparative advantage and uh, and uh, just a second, there is something on my computer. Uh, and and basically, start trading and and migrating in order to take the comparative. You're advantage. talking about six hundred years after the destruction. Yes, six hundred years after. Mm -hmm. That was. But what has happened is that the population of the Jews reduced dramatically, and. The key you, you call that rabbis. reduction, you, I'm sorry, uh, I interrupt you, but you call that reduction a collapse, a demographic collapse. It's a demographic collapse. That's and and I, I will go back after you, your introduction talking, we'll go back to that thing because this is of great interest to me, this collapse. But continue, please. So the, the, the collapse was due um, to two things. First of all, because of the rebellion against the Romans, and the second rebellion, and etc. Uh, there was a war, and uh, many Jews uh, uh, lost their life, and the Romans were quite uh, uh, tough with the Jews. They destroyed uh, the Jerusalem, uh, etc. And many, you know, since you have a war, at that about time, two, uh, you estimate two million Jews were killed. Something about two million out of uh, five point five million. Uh, then, but but but, but 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 there was I'm sorry I apologize. No, but no, there was the the solo baron, uh, and you mentioned it in your book. But by the way, your book is full of interesting numbers, and this is one of the things, one of two things that I love about your book. I mean, the other book uh, I really like is most of Jewish books are written, you know, as Jews being object of other forces, you know. To which they have to react but in your book the jews actually have their own thing and they go their own way and that affects the history of jews no less than our external forces that's very much the case is that the jews 
did an action. If it didn't succeed, they changed their course. And the rabbinite uh, Judaism basically generated a society that based on uh, on the Jewish law, you know, the Mishnah and the Talmud, which was all new, and no other uh, no other group developed over the years. You know, from the year two hundred to the year one, you know, one thousand, they generate a whole common law uh, where the rabbis were the 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 guys who made the decisions when there are disputes within Jewish and also between Jews and, and non Jews, but living under another uh, another set of laws, you know, for under Muslims and other Christians. And they always found a way how to keep their Jewish life and Jewish uh, law within the uh, the law that was uh, uh, the law of the of the uh, people who were in charge, you know, people who you know the the law with people who had the guns and the and the ability to to to, to um, make taxes and the rules, etc. And initially, Sweet. I, I, I want us to concentrate. Things. I want us to concentrate. First of all, I, I as I said before, I highly recommend your book. You know, for everybody who listens, uh, if they're not going to read your book, they're going to miss on. A lot of good stuff but of all these years 70 to 40 92 uh, by the way I'm still waiting for your second book the chosen many yeah we are working on it good so but so far we're going to talk about chosen few and we're going to talk I'd like to concentrate on a period between 70 to 6 uh, to invasion by Arabs of Jerusalem the beginning of a Muslim era these 600 years where you say, along with other uh, uh, historians, you say that the number of Jews fell, you say, from 5.5 million to 1.2 million, uh, Solar Baron from 8 million to 1.2 million, others maybe from 4 million to 1.2 million. Yeah, but it doesn't, it's the same trend. Right. But the trend, the what you call collapse, demographic collapse, is astonishing. And what is interesting in that thing, that that number actually did not much increase or change until 1492, and then it went down oh, again. It did, it actually, you know, it hasn't changed. And the key two events, first of all, the number went down, for, I said further from the wars, but almost the same amount was because a lot of the Jews uh, lived within Christian's area, and Christianity... They became Christians the, without being forced to. Yeah, but they they, they they not forced to be Christians, but it was easier to be a Christian than to be a Jew. It was a cheaper. Uh, I, I'm sorry, but in early 4th century, the Christians were persecuted by Romans, but Jews were protected. Well, there was, this was a Jew who lived in, in uh, Rome, but it, 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 Christians were also prosecuted until where, uh, the empire adopted the, Jewish, the Christian religion formally. Yeah. You know, the... Uh, 325, Constantine, he just permitted. And then later on, another 50 years, it became official religion. And of yeah, course, and, then but, Christians but then became... The Byzantine, there was the Byzantine Empire, and the Byzantine Empire uh, settled in the land of Israel and in other places, um, but not in Mesopotamia. And, right. and, and Where then, you say at that time ended up 75% of Jews. Yeah, the, the, and another 2 million converted to Christianity. 2 That's million. So uh, we're talking about the... Uh, uh, the first 300 years, there was no forced conversion to Christianity. 300 Not years. Not really forced, but they were, during the Byzantine, they put a lot of laws that uh, actually penalized Jews who did not let their children to Christianize. But that is and later. That is already the end of 4th century. I'm talking yeah, about the first the century. Three, yeah, yeah, I'm talking about the first All 300 right. years after 70 CE, you know, in 300 years, uh, 
the number of Jews is dropping, 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 dropping. They all become Christians. All the time, because to, to, to be a rabbi Jew, you have to build up a synagogue, and you are a farmer, and you have to take your children away from the field and teach them uh, to, read the, to read the Torah. And that was very expensive. And mm -hmm. uh, you could be a new Jew, a Christian Jew uh, at that time, which was uh, much easier to be a Christian Jew. And uh, th that's what, uh, what, what we observed that in location where the Jews live, uh, there were a lot of uh, Christians living next to them. So yeah, but those, are, was... those Christians, many of them were born Jews. Yeah, yeah. And then later when, uh, you know, after 630, when all the land of Israel and other places become under the Muslims, then people start converting to, but, uh, to Muslims. But, but Sri, uh, uh, maybe it's not a focus of your uh, uh, thing, but for me, the first um, 600 years after collapse of the Jewish state, in our conversation, uh, he has the most interesting uh, uh, element to it. Now, as we just mentioned the persecution of Jews that is uh, in variety of ways. And you mentioned all of the periods and by who and how and uh, in what way. Um, uh, the first 600 years, not with Islam. With Islam, maybe if we'll have another conversation, we'll talk separately because that is also very interesting, you know, uh, part of Jewish history, as all of Jewish history is, at least to me and you. Uh, so, but we're going to talk about the first five, six hundred years, which to me, that's 75, 75 uh, percent of Jews now live in that period in Mesopotamia, Persia, Mesopotamia, that region, you know, between two rivers. Now, and at the, uh, end, at the end of the period, at the end of the period now, yeah. uh, but uh they were there already even in the beginning of that period because many of the them did of not the come period, back roughly what we think in okay. the beginning i mean around the year 70 there were about two and a half million jews in the land of israel there were about million jews living in the delta in the in the, in, in egypt around alexandria and there were around million jews living in mesopotamia and there were around uh, people who living in uh, South Turkey, and, and we know even in uh, Saudi Arabia what is now. So the Jews were, but they were almost all farmers. And we know that because they were sending questions to rabbis. And the Talmud is full of questions. And all the questions were sent, almost 95% of the Questions are answered and documented at the end in the Talmud. And the historian of the Talmud, that they all say Jews were farmers in all these places. Now, the Jews in, the, in Egypt, a lot of them were died in the 115 when they had a rebellion against the, against the Roman. And then we think a lot of them converted to Christianity and the Coptic religion is probably based on Jews who uh, converted. But Romans at that time were deadly set against Christians, even more so than it's against true, Jews. But the Romans were not very strong in Egypt at that time. Mm -hmm. Romans were not very strong in Egypt at that time. And the conversion to Christianity was basically based on the fact that Christianity was a new Jew uh, they adopted the Old Testament, and it was much easier. You know, if you go today to Ethiopia, and you see the Jews who are living in Ethiopia, the Jews and the Christians, they live together. This is the whole story. There are a lot of Christians, Ethiopian Jews today, which are more Christian than Jews, and they mix together. And it's one fact about the Ethiopian Jews is that they never knew about the Talmud and the Mishnah. They stayed actually practicing Judaism 
in the way before the Rabbanites. I, I, I'm sorry, is this the reason uh, because they live together, uh, they are called uh, 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 with insulting name Falashi? Well, I, 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 the name, I don't want to go. I'm just saying that there was a lot of interaction between the two of them relative to the rest of the population, which was more kind of a pagan type population. So the 75, so, I'm sorry, the 75% of Jews who live in Mesopotamia, they live in Zoroastrian world. Yeah. The major element of population surrounding them are Zoroastrians. Yeah, but they were also Christians. We know that in Mesopotamia at that time, Mm -hmm. There were Christians communities living next to Jewish communities in villages all over, all over, uh, you know, what we call Mesopotamia, Babylon. And you, you, you mean Babylon. mostly, mostly uh, uh, ethnic uh, Assyrians? Yeah, yeah. And they were speaking uh, Aramaic. Like even today, the Kurds are speaking the same Aramaic. Mm. And they were writing uh, Hebrew in the Aramaic uh, alphabet. Mm -hmm. You know, the Hebrew that we are uh, writing today is not the ancient Hebrew that the Samarites are still using. Mm -hmm. It's the Hebrew letters that were basically based on the Aramaic al alphabet. Yeah, we call it Asherit, Assyrian script. Asherit, yeah. But, and, mm -hmm. and they were speaking between themselves at that time, Aramite. Mm -hmm. So, and how would Jews, why would Jews become Christians? What, what said, them? Because it was, it was a much cheaper way to be a Jew. You don't have to have a teacher. You don't have to teach your son to read the Bible. You don't, you can, your son can work with you. As a farmer, there was no gain to being able to read the Torah. There was no gain to be able to write a contract. There was, it was kind of a penalty on a farmer Jew. And therefore, you find that it was very close religions. You know, the Christianity and Judaism at that time were very close. One God and, uh, and uh, believe in the Bible and, and do the Ten Commandments, uh, etc. So the early Judaism was very close to what is later was the Christianity. And therefore, it was easy for Jews to convert to Christianity. That, that is what we discuss and, and we explain it economically, mm. that for a farmer, it's very expensive to be a Jew with not much gain. Everything changed once commerce became available. And then what? And then you had the comparative advantage that you have the ability to communicate, to send letters. And you have also a full set of laws um, by the rabbis. And then you find the opportunity that by uh, moving to this urban and become a craftsman, a very simple, if you're a craftsman and you do a shoe, and you have another Jew who moved to another place and can bring you good leather, and he can send you a letter from another place that how much it costs, then you can write a contract that you will do a shoe to someone in this price. Tzvi, this is very disappointing. I thought, I thought that uh, Jews uh, became literate because of dedication and devotion to God and wanting to read Torah. Now you're telling me, that's because they wanted to communicate and make some money. No, they met. they changed their law because of the Torah. Mm -hmm. But they used this ability uh -huh. to make money. Mm -hmm. That's the point. And they learned, you see, this is very interesting. They always learn to read the Torah in Hebrew. They always learn to write in Hebrew. And what happened to Jews, when they communicate, they wrote in Hebrew the language they spoke. But since the time of Ibn Ezra, there was Targumim, there was translations. 
Yes. Because most of Jews do, did not know Hebrew. Though they learn Hebrew in school, mm -hmm. I'm saying later on, in the in the Muslim period, where it uh -huh. was possible for them to travel to Europe and to travel to India, mm -hmm. they spoke mainly at the beginning. They spoke, uh, you know, Aramite and things like this. And, but later on, they start speaking Arabic because that was the that was the uh, the, the the regime. Okay, as and long as you start... push into this Muslim period, I, I, I'm going to say something about it. You know, besides Christianity, there was another big alternative for Jews, and about forty percent of them became it's Karaites, Karaims. Oh, the Karaites were Jews. They were today. Another... They're not today. They're not considered Jews, and for a long period of their history, they would not mingle with Jews, and Jews would not mingle with them. Well, it's not clear the, the, how much the Karaites were learning the Torah. They were not accepting the Mishnah and the Talmud judgment, but they accepting the Torah according to the old interpretation, and they had their own. A deviation of interpretation. So, in your figures, you, in your figures, uh, you know, and figures that uh, 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 you use, and uh, uh, Karaites are not differentiated from Jews. That's true because, because when Karaites lived in a, in a, any town, they were considered part of the Jewish community, and their taxes were similar to the Jews, and mm -hmm. Jews always paid taxes. And also, therefore, all the record, when the record of uh, that we have uh, during the Muslim period, it was jointly Karaite and Jews. And mm -hmm. the Karaite rights were the same right as the Jews. It, it continued until the Second World War, by the way. There were Karaites in Poland, and they were having their own synagogue, and they were paying before taxes with the Jews. I'm talking about before the Nazis. But later they tried to claim that they are not Jews in order to survive the, the Nazi. I'm talking about many years later. So but, they, but Karaites claim that they are not Jews since 1789, since Russian occupation of Crimea. They yeah, had they were, special embassy to Tsar with the claim that they are not really Jews. They were, you know, depends on if they wanted to if to be Jew, it was a benefit to them or not a benefit. Okay. And that was depends on how they write down the contract with the regime at that time. So, of course, uh, their survival the by, yeah. by the Jews were considered very close to Jews, like the Samurai. Okay. And you know, most of the Samurai today live uh, in Israel and they uh, um, melt down mm -hmm. with the Jewish population here. Well, and, um, uh, uh, but they were small. There was small percentage, not uh, very important. Uh, talking, talking about this uh, number of Jews uh, uh, continuously. So it drops to 1.2 million in the beginning of uh, uh, seventh century. Then, it, if I remember correctly, the graph that you provide, you provide many graphs. I love it. I, I, I have to say, you know, if any historian should be also. Uh, uh, economist like you so to have ability to use some numbers so it goes up but only a little bit from 1.2 million to about 1.5 million and then yeah. it goes down again yeah and then in so 1492 it yeah. went up during the Muslim period mm -hmm. and we have the data but just a little bit just yeah. a little bit just a little bit the just number of Muslims bit. went up a lot but the number of Jews, just, you know, 20%, 15%. Well, Muslims went up because people convert to uh, mm -hmm. Islam. It, it's conversion. Um, in terms of uh, Jews went up because of just uh, keeping up the population and actually living in good conditions during the Muslim empire because of their moving into urban occupations. They actually increased, they doubled the standard of living. We have the numbers. I mean, the uh, the standard of living on average Jew who live in a 
in this new town, uh, Baghdad, established in uh, the mid 18th, 18th century. And uh, Baghdad was a town uh, with uh, probably 25% uh, uh, Jews. Mm. We have tax record and they pay higher taxes. And they live, the average standard of living was almost twice than that of farmers. And they move within 100 years from villages to all the new cities. All the cities, Basra, Mosul, Baghdad, were cities with full of Jews. And Jews were having a higher standard of living there. And that was a good time to stay Jew. There was no reason to convert. The Judaism enabled them to have to be Jew and to finance the rabbis and to finance the yeshivas and to be able to live a high, high quality life in a close community within a big cities. And that was the golden era. From the 8th century to the 12th century, 13th century, it was the golden era and some migration to the West, you know, to uh, North Africa, to uh, Spain, uh, France, Germany, uh, England, and are you uh, saying uh, I'm, I'm sorry I'm uh, are you saying the Jews of France uh, England uh, they were also uh, uh, genetically connected to what became Sephardic Jews oh sure Ashkenazic Jews Ashkenazic also? Jews were probably came from a very small location there is some debate among uh, people doing now DNA and uh, other studies but it's clear that they came some somewhere either from North Turkey or South Turkey. But and when they find out uh, um, bones of Jews in uh, Germany today from the 14th century, and they do DNA, they all uh, related to Jews who live in the East. And there yeah. is a connection. I, 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 it seems like family of Kalanimos, you know. It, it, it is something that is important for Jews of uh... the, the Sephardic Jews, what we call Sephardic Jews and Ashkenazi Jews, mm -hmm. that was produced around the 13th century. And I want to emphasize, we have the Benjamin Metudel of Tudela, Benjamin from Tudela, who basically did a big tour from Europe to middle, you know, to to uh, and. Mesopotamia to uh, uh, Egypt to Israel to the land of Israel etc and he went to synagogues and asked the rabbi how many families belong to you and from there we get the 1.5 million 1.5 and, and it was divided what we call now Ashkenaz or not is because of two rabbi one come from Rashi who live in South Germany uh, you know and the other one is the Rambam who first born in Spain, moved to Morocco, and from Morocco to Egypt, and most of his life he lived in four state, uh, and uh, basically he had a big influence on all the uh, non-Ashkenazi Jews, and since then we have the Sephardic and the Ashkenazi up to today, okay. but they were very connected, you know, the most important uh, book that was written on Judaism is what we call Shulchan Aruch, which is a uh, table and this was written by uh, Sephardic and then adopted by the Ashkenazi in the beginning of the 16th century in 1520 something and therefore the basic laws were very much the same interpretations were different and uh, well uh, we, we can talk about it some other time because that is also an interesting topic but let's get back to uh, demography and uh, uh, way of life of yeah. Jews in the first 600 years, you know, in Mesopotamia, where 75%, according to you, of Jews lived. I mean, Jews basically, you say, disappeared. I mean, before, the, before, before the Muslims. Before Islam, yes. Before Islam. Right. This is. Jews, what we know about Jews at that time, yeah. mainly the main source is what we call the Babylonian Talmud. What is a Babylonian Talmud? A Babylonian Talmud are answers of rabbis to questions sent by Jews in the yeshiva. They make the judgment. 
and almost all the Babylonian Talmud are questions by farmers. So we know we, we, and, we and understand we know the name of the villages. Uh, the, way, if you talk about farmers, what kind of a farming uh, uh, Jews were involved in at that time? What what is was their preference? Like others, you know, wheat uh, producing uh, uh, producing few uh, uh, basic uh, bread and uh, and other vegetables to eat. Did and they have the their vegetables. own land? Did yeah. they buy? Did they buy their own land there in Mesopotamia? Yeah, they were farmers like others. Either they had their own land. Most of them they have their own uh, uh, land, or they were uh, sharecropping. Uh huh. And, um, and it, it, is, it, it actually written in the Talmud, in the Babylonian Talmud. You own the land, or you are a sharecropper of the land of someone else. But it was not a feudal system. It was a free farming system. Not only the Jews, also the rest of the population. It was the similar farming. There was no difference between Jewish farmers or uh, uh, pagan farmers or Christian farmers. Hmm. And most of them were all farmers. Very interesting. Uh, what, them, what about the role of slaves in farming? I mean, you mentioned just in one place in your book, but uh, farming, there especially. No, there was some slaves, according to the Jewish law, slave get free after a few years. Um, Only if he was born Jewish, not if he is purchased. If he is yeah, purchased, he is no, for the rest of his life. Let me put it this way. Slavery was not the way of farming at that time. Was not? No. Okay. There were some slaves, but it was not the common uh, way. Most farmers lived from the product they produced and sold. There's Most one thing, you know, uh, Tzvi, uh, the book is fantastic, and I highly recommend for everybody to purchase, to have it, to go to the library and borrow it and read it. You'll find all kinds of good, 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 good things. But there's some problems with this book that I see. And if you allow me, I'm going to sure. Go ahead. Uh, the movement of Mazdak is not mentioned. The what? Mazdakite movement in Mesopotamia in 6th century is not mentioned. The what, what movement? Mazdak. Mazdak. M-A-Z-D-A-K. He was... Okay, I have to... He, I, I should uh, learn about this. There were a lot of things happening in Mesopotamia at that time that we did not discuss. Yeah, this is, but this is important because this is during the reign of Kavad the Great, Kavad the First. And the movement of Mazdak played an incredible, import, incredibly important role in the economy, politics, and transformation of, uh, of uh, uh, Mesopotamian society and in Jewish history. You know, uh, the, the, the first time I came across it, it was um, in the work of uh, Professor Nusner who's no longer with us. I spoke to him, <laughs> was a very interesting guy. Um, uh, I spoke to him several times uh, about it. And then my own professor, Professor Golb, you know, from University of Chicago, uh, toward the end of his life, you know, switched from Ashkenazic Jews to Jews of Mesopotamia. He became interested. I do not know what he's done. I did not see anything that he published. But uh, for me, uh, the interest is special and should be for you, given that you do labor studies, you know. By the way, my bachelor's degree in labor studies from Roosevelt University. Uh, uh, wh why it was interest interesting to me? Because it was the first communist movement in the world. Of what? The first communist movement in the oh, world. communist movement. Demanding, demanding common ownership of land and women. How do you like this? Well, Look, I, I want to emphasize, there are a lot, a lot, when you go over a hundred of years, yeah. there are a lot of uh, new movements and, uh, and, uh, and, and certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, rebellions. There were uh, a lot 
of threat between different ethnic groups who generated a lot of day-to-day -day discussion. We don't focus on those as long as we don't think they made a major change in the, I... in the a major change in the economic and the way Jews live. Okay. And, and this particular moment did major, major change in Jewish life. Of what I sort? Thought. Well, first of all, commonality of land ownership and wives. Jews resisted it. Especially those that had the, uh, uh, the land and wife. They did not want to share it. That's number one. Number two... Well, Jews at that time in, uh, could have several wives. I understand. And so did others. So Zoroastrians could have, I think one of them, uh, Hasro, whatever it is, I found somewhere. See, Jews, Jews, Muslim Jews, I mean, uh, Jews who live in the Muslim area. Not Muslim. Uh, there was no Muslims at that time. Islam no, no, came no, in. Muslim, but I mean, yeah. you're talking about that time, Jews until the 10th century, there was no, the, the Jews could have several uh, wives. I understand. Like, but we, like uh, all the population around. Yes. But they could own land, for sure. It's written in the Talmud. They could own land, or they do sharecropping. That was the standard way of uh, farmer life. So I'm not saying that there was no kind of a cooperative in one place, but I don't think it was a major change in the Jewish, at least I don't know, that it changed completely the way Jews were operating. In fact, during this Kavad the first, I mean, he ruled in two uh, periods. Uh, in between those periods, he was out of power. The rule was in hands of the guy who staged coup, who was supported by a lot of Jews. Jews were not only farmers in Mesopotamia. Oh, sure, there were some Jews who were uh, also not farmers. In but military, a lot of Jews were in military. In military of what? Of, of whom? Of Persia. Of Persia, maybe? I don't a lot know. of I Jews. Never, I, I didn't count it. The, the, the bulk of National Guard of Persian Shah was Jews. When? In the 4th century? In the 4th century, in 3rd century, in 5th century, in 6th century. And what, I'm, like what I want to say... The but when we look at the Talmud, we don't find many questions and answers based on those people. Yeah, but Talmud, first of all, did not care about many other things that is of interest to a normal human being like myself. And secondly... <laughs> no, 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 but I'm saying yes. when we try to understand... Who was a Jew? So the definition of a Jew during that time is someone who belonged to the Jewish community who had to pay taxes. That's the way we define Jews. And who belonged to Jewish community? Those who pay taxes by the... By, you see, all the time... in the, in uh, the uh, Children, children Abbasid, of Jewish men and non-Jewish women were not considered part of Jewish community. Let, let me say the following. I, we, I don't know much about the period you're talking about. Okay. So I want to emphasize that I don't uh, I we didn't study in detail what was the common way of Jews living in Mesopotamia between uh, uh, 100 to 600 because the only thing that we used for that time who was a Jew is those who belong to a Jewish community went to the synagogue and followed the rabbi rules. That's our definition of Jews. Well, uh, what I'm saying so is there this. could be yes. Jews who did not belong to this group. And we know that there were a lot of Christians. So I'm not saying that all the Jews, all who called themselves Jew, was following the, the law. But we focus mm -hmm. on the population that follow the that follow the rabbi rules, which is documented in the Babylonian Talmud that was basically was written until the end of the 4th century. That's what we do in our study. Right. Uh, I, I guess that is one of the reasons that this period of uh, Mazdak, which played very important role in Jewish history, which was 
a hundred years after that, after closing of Talmud, is not Maybe. mentioned there. But uh, uh, so it didn't have an impact. You see, if you look at the Jews during the Muslim period, mm -hmm. so during the Muslim period, the Jews were under the you know one of the Nagid who was uh, basically uh, established by the uh, Abbasi later on. The Abbasi regime was in Baghdad, and the Nagid was actually uh, emphasizing all the taxes and all the rules for the Jews and negotiated them with the Muslim. Uh, so we focus on the uh, on all the period before on the Talmud, on the Babylonian Talmud of description of the Jews, and later on on what we have basically from the uh, Gniza. Mm -hmm. Most of what we talk about is how the Jews lived in the 8th, 9th century and uh, to the 12th century under Muslims based on the Gniza documents. Mm -hmm. And question and answer with rabbis, you know, the, the response. This is our, we based on this our evidence. So I don't know about this particular 100 mm -hmm. years. You say it was very important. If it was very important, it should have affected what's going on in the Talmud, and it should have affected what's going on, uh, not the Talmud, because it was after, but it should have had effect on how the Jews lived in Mesopotamia during the Muslim period. Uh, yes, it should have been, but once Talmud was closed, there was not much written by Jews afterwards. There were oh, some no, things. Of course they do. All the Gaonim period, there was a lot of uh, question and answers, and the key evidence that we have is the is, is the Gniza. The Gniza, uh, of, of, it was in Cairo. Yeah, Gniza, he has a lot of... On, on the Jews, you know, when I talk to historians, they say that the, the Gniza is not only document of the Jews, it's the most important document from the 9th century to the 12th century on all the Mediterranean society. Hmm. Well, uh, what hopefully... historian yeah. tell me, and then you know there is Moshe Gil. We read Moshe Gil, who wrote the, about the Jews from the six hundred until uh, twelve hundred, twelve fifty, until the Mongols, and we base all our analysis on the information Moshe Gil provided in his book, which is based on question and answers a lot. He actually document all the occupation the Jews had at that time. He from question and answer to rabbis, which exist today, which uh, survived that time, and the Gniza. Well, uh, we're having a little bit of time only left, but given that you met, touched on Gniza, you know, uh, I, I, I can't avoid it because one of the first documents from Gniza is the letter of Kievan Jewish community of early uh, 10th century. Uh, and uh, the Jews of, you, you do mention there in, on your map, if I remember, you do have some indication of presence of Jews in Northern Black Sea. Sure. Um, sure. Not a lot though. We, we, we discussed that there were large Jewish communities by uh, Benjamin of Tudela mm -hmm. that described huge Jewish Benjamin of Tudela already afterwards. It's afterwards, but it's clear existed before. They were, they were, we, we, we don't know. You look, we are, we are looking for what is mentioned in the, the Gniza, and the Gniza described Jews who living in Iran. Uh, they describe letters that coming from Jews in those places, and um, and I don't remember exactly the date of each uh, document, but I'm pretty sure it's true that there were Jews living in, as I said, in in the Black Sea there and in the northern uh, in northern Turkey. Uh, but not simply the Jews lived there. There was a huge state, huge state called Khazaria. Yeah, but with the Khazarim, it, the evidence of the Khazari within Jewish community, all the sand book, we think it's uh, 
non-documented uh, theory. And uh, we basically wrote quite a bit in the, in the new papers with other historians, why? And the point is that the, 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 the basic story is based on a letter from, I think it is the ninth century that mentioned by, uh, uh, from a rabbi in, uh, in, uh, in Spain. But uh, we don't have You're any talking evidence. about uh, correspondence between Just King... a second. I, yeah. I would say the following. You see, when you say Karaites, we have evidence of Karaites living everywhere. All the history until recently, until the after Second World War. We have uh, uh, Yemenites, we have any other ethnic group of Jews who move from one location to the other, kept their identity by language, by uh, prayers, by songs, by everything. There is no existence of uh, Kuzaris in uh, any significant communities after the uh, Mongol uh, invasion. Almost no. But Mongol invasion happened already 200 years after Khazaria was crushed by... Uh... I, that's what I'm saying. Therefore, the old Jews probably... All, if, if Khazaria become Jewish, that we don't have evidence of that as well, it was before the Mongols, and after the Mongols... Meaning the, the correspondence between Ibn Shaprut and King Joseph of Khazaria plays no role, or correspondence between uh, Jew of Constantinople and uh, plays no role? Or the I'm letters from Kiev? plays no role. I'm just saying yeah. that it does not identify a large Jewish community that has a significance of Khazaria basics anywhere. Yeah in the documents, not nothing in the documents of the Gniza, nothing in the documents of question and answer of rabbis. Mm. And if you go after the Mongols, there is no evidence of Khazaria sources living anywhere. There is one little community that was in uh, Kiev for a while, but it disappears completely. So therefore... Tzvi, uh, Tzvi, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to disagree with you in a big you, way just, you, just, you can, no just in a big should. way in a big way i'm not gonna t talk about it i'm just gonna state very clearly that i absolutely disagree with you on this point completely and with whoever okay. else is talking about it you know because uh, uh i have done a lot of work put a lot of work in this uh, uh, uh area and i've been in those places and i've seen the remaining objects that now by the way are in hermitage when i saw them in uh, 1998 they were in a garbage in a garbage i'm not saying that there were no jews living in this area i'm just saying that after the mongol era well, there has been no huge jewish community that was based on Khazari jews with their own identity and their own language, and mm -hmm. their own prayers, and their own songs, and their own uh, I, uh, Jewish After, life. When, when Mongols, when Mongols came, second, yeah. just let me complete, like mm -hmm. the Spanish, who kept the Ladino all these years, like the Ashkenazi, which was all based on uh, German, uh, on Germany, and uh, the German community, so Jewish communities, throughout history, kept their identity. There was a small Jewish community in Greece that actually belonged to... Most Jewish community kept their separate identity throughout the years. And the Khazari disappeared. Yes. Uh, so there was no Khazars, there was no Jews of Khazari, was, there was no so. Polovce, was there was saying, nobody. I, I was not saying so, mm. Alexander. I didn't say that there was no. What I'm saying is that their influence on Jewish life, what we call the Ashkenazi Jews, yeah. that's what I'm doing now, has zero impact. Okay, good. Uh, and I disagree with you completely because the earliest Ashkenazi Jews do come from Hazaria and they settle in what was at that time Lithuania. Lithuanian state that stretched from Baltic to Black Sea. Uh, we, we disagree on that. Okay, that's good. We, we, 
we think that all the Lithuania Jews came from the same source from uh, Jewish uh, Yiddish uh, spoken Jews. I understand. You they follow. You, you follow. Of yeah. Jews, they were using all the Ashkenazi uh, language that was built in South Germany in the from the ninth to the twelfth century, and they were migrating into Poland, Lithuania, and when Lithuania became with Polish, it was all based on the same source on natural growth. It was all natural growth. Natural growth of Jews was 1.4 from all the numbers that we have. Jews in Poland, Lithuania pay taxes. We have census of Jews in 1764 and five. 1764, this is already, you know, future. We took yeah, no, no, the no, beginning. We have, data, we have data on Jews living in Lithuania, in Pins in 1516. We have data on Jews living all over Poland, Lithuania throughout the period. That's our second book. What, what about before there was Poland, Lithuania? Before, before there the was Poland, Union. Lithuania, there was almost no Jews. There really? were no Jews in Poland, Lithuania. Yeah. There were no Jews all over. The number of Jews that we have, because there was a Jewish tax, in, uh, there was a Jewish tax, there was a special tax, and we have a tax record of Jews from the first uh, uh, from the first time that they get in uh, 1264. There was the first right for the Jews to live in Poland. We do have Jewish taxes, and from these taxes and documents, we know all the mentioned Jews in Poland, Lithuania, throughout the history. And it has been written by historians very carefully, the number of Jews all over. There were very few Jews there, almost none. And Jews, in order to live there in Europe, everywhere, they need a privilege. Without the privilege, they couldn't live anywhere. Without paying taxes as a Jewish community, they couldn't live anywhere. And there is no privilege given to anyone who has a Kazarian name or a Kazarian language or a Kazarian source all over. And there cannot be a Jew living in Kiev without having a privilege to live in Kiev. Uh, okay, I'm, not gonna, I'm, not, I'm not going to be <laughs> commenting on this thing. I just say I am fundamental disagreement with you on this point. But I still highly, highly recommend your book, The Chosen Few. And I hope that there's going to be a second book. I do not know if it's going to be called The Chosen Many. Because it's I have to... It's going to be The Chosen Many because oh. they were growing in an un unprecedented uh, number in Poland, Lithuania. It's only after massacre of Chmielnitsky. Very few were massacred by Chmielnitsky. It's incorrect yeah. what you say. It's not correct. Half were not, not massacred. Not very few. The numbers that we know now is that the Jewish population went down by 1%. Who, who do you know this number from? From, from, uh, from uh, all the studies that were done on Jewish community and non-Jewish community mm -hmm. within Poland, Lithuania. And uh, for example, we know that in, in different cities, we have the number of Jews and we have the taxes that paid by Jews before and after. And the number of taxes went up afterwards. And the number of Jews were growing one point, actually growing almost 2% from 1500 to 1648. And it was continued from uh, 1660. So it's uh, 60, according to you, in 1648, how many Jews there were there? In 1648, I don't have the number in front of me, but it uh, should have been something like uh, something like 150,000. 150,000. Because according to a person you know that says similar things to no, you. No, no, no. This is the numbers we have is Sergio de la Pergola, all the numbers based on on uh, tax, uh, the, the tax records uh, and community records that exist of Jews and the privileges uh, that existed. And uh, that's the latest studies. And we have it in a paper published in the Economic Journal. You can read there. And there is an appendix for all the sources. This is very interesting and especially interesting. If you go to my web page, you can see a paper written by Maristella, me, and another uh, historian. And we have a paper just on Jewish population in Poland, Lithuania, and Germany. 
from 1500 to uh, uh, 1929, 1930. Sri, I'm going to do that. Thank you for mentioning Very good, Alexander. Thank you for the discussion. Thank you for your coming to Chicago Jewish Cafe and keep yourself safe. We're all with you, you in Israel. All the best. As they say in China, Zai Gizint, and the very best. Yeah. Thank you very much.